Hello and welcome dear students and other folks who stumble across this video on YouTube. My name is Leonard Dobusch. I'm a professor of organization at University of Innsbruck in Austria. And uh, this is the lecture for class three of the course Organizing in Times of Crisis, devoted to the role of bureaucracy in crisis contexts. Most of you, when hearing the term bureaucracy, may first think about complicated, boring rules and public administrations. And that is not entirely wrong. Um, and uh, we will particularly dis discuss um, public bureaucracies in this lecture as well. However, when organization scholars speak or think about bureaucracy, they first think about the German sociologist Max Weber, who identified bureaucracies as the rationalized form of organizations in modernity. According to Weber, bureaucracy is superior to any other form in terms of precision, instability, and stringency of its discipline and its reliability. Note, however, already in this um, quote, bureaucracy is not superior in any way or for any task, uh, but has certain qualities that uh, Weber uh, admired or, and also maybe feared to some degree in bu bureaucracies. Of course, we are talking here now about what Weber called an ideal typical bureaucracy, an ideal type of bureaucracy, meaning that real world bureaucracies, of course, oftentimes depart from these uh, qualities. Um, when we talk about organizing in crisis, uh, the question, of course, um, is which of these features are particularly helpful in crisis situations? And I would say potentially all of those. So let, let's look, have a second look at these uh, qualities that are listed here. In fighting, for example, an epidemic, um, you want to have precise data, uh, precise tracking, precise testing. So precision is key. You want essential facilities and institutions, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, supermarkets, etc. You want uh, them and everything related to, to care responsibilities. You want these institutions, these facilities to be stable. You want them to be disciplined and you want them to be reliable even in spite of new and enormous pressures that uh, are associated with su such a situation. So, um, when we uh, want to achieve these qualities, um, we need, of course, discuss what what are is the organizational um, format, what are the organizational characteristics that might uh, allow us to achieve these qualities. And according to Weber, um, there are several characteristics of such stable, precise, disciplined, and reliable forms of organization. So, for example, uh, important is that power belongs to an office, not the office holder. So people can be replaced. <laughs> um, in an epidemic or a pandemic, uh, that's something that has to happen uh, continuously as uh, people fall ill or become sick and then have to be replaced. And But the, the whole organization, the whole organizational routines, they should continue to work as planned. Uh, this works uh, because the authority configuration is specified by formal rules. So rules are explicated. This doesn't mean that there are no informal rules. Um, actually, in any uh, bureaucracy, there are also informal rules, but um, driven and key for the functioning of a bureaucracy in the barbarian sense are uh, formal rules. And these formal rules, uh, they specify tasks for different categories of personnel, uh, and it's these tasks, this division of tasks according to formal rules that then allows specialization. Specialization both uh, in terms of people fulfilling a certain task or role in an organization, but also already specialization when it comes to um, education. So there are specialized educator, education facilities, universities, uh, university courses on certain uh, roles. Um, another aspect of a f bureaucracy is a tendency towards hierarchy um, so that uh, if people cannot be resolved at lower levels, they are um, delegated up the hierarchy where someone 
and in the end management or leadership has to decide. Um, to be awarded a position uh, you have to uh, be able to show your formal credentials uh, that are certified, certified either by um, renowned education facilities, institutions such as a university, or within a bureaucracy there are their own um, educational programs that certify formal credential credentials, and these formal credentials may then be a precondition for uh, making a career, but overall careers in uh, bureaucracies uh, they depend on seniority or merit of service. So to some degree, bureaucracies are considered to be meritocracies as well, so that it's not um, who you know, ideal typically speaking, of course, and it's not who your parents have been or uh, what is responsible for your, for getting promoted, but it's rather how well you did your, your tasks in the bureaucracy. And... Um, Overall, communication, coordination, and control in bureaucratic forms of organization are centralized, so that's kind of also related to the uh, characteristic of the hierarchy. Um, given these characteristics of uh, bureaucratic organizing, it is no wonder that uh, bureaucracies do not work in all contexts. But even in contexts where we find bureaucratic forms of organizing, such as large corporations or said public administrations, the virtues and qualities of bureaucracies are regularly challenged. And uh, for simplicity and this lecture, I will distinguish only between two traditions of bureaucracy critique, and I have put two pictures of uh, people who are uh, quite uh, prominent and renowned for uh, you know, embodying one of these uh, streams of bureaucracy critique. Um, on the one hand, we have an entrepreneurial critique of bureaucracy bemoaning a lack of efficiency and entrepreneurial spirit and thus innovativeness. And on the other uh, line, hand or the other line of criticism, um, uh, does not share this fear of a lack of efficiency quite the contrary, uh, but rather has, has has rather ethical concerns, worrying that uh, bureaucracies might function um, very well, but at the same time act as a moral sleeping pill. Um, so who are these two guys? Uh, you can read the names already on the slide. On the one hand is Tom Peters, uh, a management guru, uh, so to speak. He became, uh, rose to prominence after publishing a book, Searching for Excellence. Um, he's a former McKinsey uh, advisor. Um, and uh, in his books, he um, uh, he demands more flexibility, more innovativeness, more rule-breaking entrepreneurship than any bureaucracy that takes uh, Weber seriously can deliver. Of course, he particularly um, is, is particularly critical uh, about large organization, uh, corporations and their bureaucratic structures, and he is arguing that uh, to survive in highly dynamic uh, circumstances, these uh, organizations have to leave bureaucracy behind. Uh, so he even says, I beg each and every one of you to develop a public and passionate hatred of bureaucracy. So, But that's a very entrepreneurial style of critique, arguing that actually what uh, Weber um, uh, has promised, namely that bureaucracies are highly efficient in accomplishing uh, their aims, that this uh, in certain corporate contexts cannot be delivered. But still, Peters in his critique takes the characteristics of Weberian bureaucracy seriously and criticizes it exactly for its stability, for its discipline. And that's true also for the second line of critique um, by authors such as sociologist and Holocaust uh, survivor Sigmund Baumann. Um, uh, they also take uh, the Weberian characteristics uh, such as stability, uh, discipline, reliability seriously, um, but they take a completely different route, a more ethical route of critique and uh, scold bureaucracy exactly for its efficiency independent of its aims. So according to Baumann, bureaucratic endeavors such as the division of labor into smaller and smaller tasks or the taxonomic categorization of different species or the tendency to view obedience to rules as a morally good value in and of itself, they all, all these um, aspects and characteristics and also consequences of bureaucratic organizing, they all played their role in the Holocaust uh, 
coming to pass. So Sid Bauman writes that the Holocaust is so crucial to our understanding of the modern bureaucratic mode of rationalization because it reminds us just how formal and ethically blind is the bureaucratic pursuit of efficiency. So, um, facing a crisis such as the current corona situation, we therefore might strive for reconciling the, the powers of bureaucracy with both these strands of, of criticism. An example where these angles come together in some sense uh, is the story of Bill Gates, who recently uh, announced that he will fund seven factories for potential coronavirus vaccines, even though probably only two of those will eventually put, be put to use. For one, uh, this move recognizes that just inventing a vaccine, exploration, entrepreneurship, so to speak, is not enough. We also need exploitation. The vaccine has to be produced at scale, which requires stability, precision, and reliability, and uh, the history of a bureaucratic learning curve. On the other hand, Gates' decision is a response to the ethical issue that any delay will lead to more deaths due to the virus. Um, at the same time, this story is one of private organizing, private bureaucracies, and critics uh, were fast to, uh, to point out that this investment might help Gates health and vaccination businesses. I don't want to judge it here. I just, I just want to uh, give this example uh, to show that in practice, these uh, different aspects of bureaucracy and uh, critiques of bureaucracy, they might all come together and might, might be discussed at once. And this is not just true in the private sector, but I would say it's even more true for public uh, sector bureaucracies and uh, their role in crisis. So um, there are two reasons to put this center stage in this lecture. Center stage in this lecture. First, public bureaucracies are usually considered to be role models of Weberian-style bureaucracy, in good as well as in bad. Second, uh, and particularly in large-scale crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Public uh, bureaucracies and their functionalities or dysfunctionalities make a huge difference for the outcome. Generally, uh, there is a reason why public administrations are particularly prone to Weber Weberian style uh, bureaucratic forms. And actually, as I'm also a legal scholar, let me make the democratic case for bureaucracy in the public realm, which basically rests on three pillars. First, proviso of the law. So, um, in the public sector, no administrative action may take place without a legal democratic basis. So, and this legal democratic basis is exactly what uh, public bureaucracies deliver in terms of formally codified rules that can be traced back to the law and the prohibition of any arbitrary action. So, that's uh, important for uh, a democratic foundation. The second pillar is equality before the law. Sine ira et studio is uh, uh, something that is a core bureaucratic value. So individuals must be treated equally by the law. And again, this is tied to key characteristics of a functioning bureaucracy, naming, meaning that outcomes should be predictable. The outcomes should be stable. And then the third pillar, pillar is uh, rational legal authority, meaning that individual actions of public officials follow a clear chain of command. So in a way, that's the flip side of uh, the coin of proviso of the law, uh, is that you need a hierarchy, and this tendency towards hierarchy is something that you have in the bureaucracy, and it's about the roles and not the persons filling these roles. Um, so um, these uh, three um, pillars are... Um, ideal typical qualities of public administrations, of course, meaning that in reality, uh, public administrations may deviate substantially from them. At the same time, public administrations um, are also confronted with demands to become more flexible and efficient. Under the label new public management, administrative reforms have been pushed with the idea of applying private sector management concepts in public bureaucracies and um, the the reason for uh, for the, this criticism is uh, that um, new public management promises um, more efficient public administrations by 
implementing uh, more competition oriented concepts by increasing in, 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 by incentivizing certain behaviors by something that's called as customer orientation. So um, Rick Vogel, a public administration scholar in Hamburg, he summarized uh, the discourse uh, on new public management uh, that uh, it is an increase in efficiency or that's promised by new public management by utilizing mechanisms of business-like performance management while at the same time stepping up the decentralization and autonomy of local governments. Also important in this context is the application of new technical uh, possibilities of the information age or the knowledge economy. But as you can see, um, this managerial perspective with this focus on efficiency uh, that is mainly pursued by means of output control is to some degree at odds with uh, bureaucratic virtues such as the focus on reliability and legality and uh, that is mainly uh, pursued by means of input and process control. Um, uh, to some degree, that's also a reason why there has been a substantial pushback against new public management uh, concepts in public administration. So uh, there is uh, discussions about limited transferability of private sector concepts due to the incommensurability of these two uh, rationalities and logics, uh, the managerial logic and the bureaucratic logic, and also due to idiosyncrasies of private and public sectors. And um, if we look at the current corona situation and um, the roles that hospitals or intensive care units and intensive care beds have in this situation, one can see that um, many previous suggestions inspired by uh, pub new public management logics to reduce the number of intensive care units and, uh, in hospitals because they are expensive and they uh, don't pay uh, off uh, to some degree has been put into question nowadays. Um, then, uh, to some degree, however, um, new public management uh, has so so that's one of the reasons why new public management has come also under under pressure and and, and has has in a way earned a lot of counter criticism, and um, more recently, um, another. Uh, approach has picked up some of the criticism of new public management concepts while doubling down on the use of new digital technologies in public administrations uh, and the idea associated with, uh, associated with these new um, uh, types of new suggestions is um, labeled open government. Here the idea is uh, to use new digital means uh, such as crowdsourcing tools to not just but also uh, improve efficiency, but also at the same time achieve, and that's uh, what uh, Kornberger et al. in their study of open government and open data in uh, the municipality of Vienna have uh, described as uh, a goal or aim of open government approaches is to achieve a more democratic, collaborative and transparent administration through public access to data, to public administration uh, deliberations and uh, decisions. So what we can see here is that, um, in a way, the, it it, it uh, follows uh, the goal of increasing public sector and public administrative efficiency on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also introduces some ethical um, perspectives and some ethical issues uh, in terms of uh, and recognizing uh, that the different logics in public sectors, namely that public administrations have to be rooted in democratic processes and wants to correct actually for some of the critique that um, the that uh, public administrations get too uh, detached from uh, democratic foundations and have to be um, and, and and to some degree open government as a way to correct for deficiencies of uh, public administrations in practice so um, when we look now at this, what we have discussed here with regard to public uh, bureaucracies, the question is, should they become more managerial? Should they become more open? Um, so, actually, we have these uh, uh, three uh, perspective and virtues, and they are, might be compatible in some regard, but then there might be uh, incommensurable or conflicting in others. So, when dealing with crisis situations, 
public administrations have to accomplish their tasks in this nexus of traditional Weberian uh, virtues of bureaucratic organizing, of demands by new public management concepts rooting in the entrepreneurial critique of bureaucracy, and of open government ideas that add ethical critiques to the mix. Um, and um, and, and I, one could say this is a challenge in its own right, but at the same time, um, if you want to uh, accomplish a, a, a professional and a, a successful response to crisis situation, it's probably best to try to reconcile these uh, partly countervailing, partly complementary um, demands in the context of public administrative action. That's it for this uh, lecture uh, on uh, bureaucracy and crisis um, regarding the openness angle that I have only teased here at the very end uh, when talking about open government, we will continue to, uh, to look a little deeper into openness as an organizing principles, a principle particularly in crisis contexts in class 8 of this course uh, entitled Open Science, Open Data and Commons. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and hopefully we will, uh, you will uh, listen also to further um, classes in this lecture and uh, if you have feedback uh, or any comments or uh, then we will please uh, feel free uh, to comment uh, in uh, on the YouTube uh, channel of this course thank you <laughs>